Hello Logic people, welcome back to my delightful garage. We're going to continue with predicate logic and we're going to start doing proof today. Proof. Okay. Which means we're going to learn some new rules of inference and equivalence. But first, let's just review our old rules. It's good to remind yourself of these regularly anyways and practice proofs in propositional logic. Predicate logic will use all the old rules of propositional logic plus more. Let's look at the old rules. MP. I'm not going to write it out, but that's modus ponens. Remember that? Circle arrow square, circle, therefore square. Let's do MT. Circle arrow square. Deny the uh, consequent, then you get to deny the antecedent. Um, double negation. I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to be careful about the order. Circle is the same thing as saying not not circle. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. CS. Conjunctive syllogism. Right? If you have the negation of a conjunction and you have one of these conjuncts, then it follows that the other conjunct is false. DS, start with a disjunction. If one of them is not true, um, then the other one has to be true. I'm not going to give both versions. Okay. Let's see. Uh, DM, De Morgan's. Remember there was two versions of this, the neither nor, neither circle nor square is the same thing as saying, um, remember this is a rule of equivalence, not circle and not square. There's the other version, neither and I guess you could call it, and this is the same thing as saying not not circle or not square. Uh, what, el what else do we have? We had sim simplification. If you have circle and square, you can derive circle. You can also derive square. Might as well put that there. Conjunction. If you have circle and square, you can derive circle and square. You can derive the other order as well, square and circle. We had disjunction. Let's see, if you have circle, you can derive circle or square. All right, what am I missing? I don't have a list. Um, yeah, let's do transposition. Circle arrow square is the same thing as saying not uh, square arrow not circle. It's also called contraposition. MI, or material implication. Let's see, circle arrow square is the same thing as saying not circle or, yeah, that's a rule of equivalence, right? Same thing. I should say right here, rule of equivalence for transposition as well. Circle over square in material application is the same thing as saying not circle or square. And we saw another form of that as well. Let's see, biconditional equivalence, circle double arrow square is the same thing as saying circle arrow square and let's see, square arrow circle. There's one that this edition of your textbook uses, R, reiteration. If you have circle, you can derive circle reiter reiteration. Remember, any formula can fill in for circle and square right here. Let's see, as long as you're consistent here. And it can be as complex as you want. There's one more. I think we covered dilemma, but we didn't really make that official. You actually don't need that. We have two proof strategies. We have conditional proof, CP, don't forget that. And then we also have reductio, we just call that capital R. So this is all old stuff. You can use all that old stuff plus new, okay? Plus new rules. All right, I'm gonna list those new rules right here in the order that we're going to learn them, 
not in the order that you find in the book. Okay? The order that we're going to do it in is in terms of the easy rules first, then the harder rules. The book does it easy rule, hard rule, easy rule, hard rule. We're not going to do it that way. So we're going to begin with a rule called UI, universal instantiation. Um, yeah, it's not the, maybe the most memorable name, although maybe it's a good heavy metal band name. Uh, the next one is too good, good name for a heavy metal band. And that is EG, existential generalization. I'm going to call these the easy rules. They don't have any restrictions. And let me give you a, just like here I use geometrical figures to give you the pattern of reasoning, the rule involved here. Let's try to do with UI. What do I have for UI right here? If you have a universal quantification, I'll talk more about that today, right here. If you have universal quantification like this, um, this right here would, this would here be sent for a predicate, no matter how complex. Again, we'll talk more about this later. But if you have this, you can infer an instance of this universal claim circle, and this small n would represent um, an individual name or constant. So this is the form of reasoning used in UI, this form right here. E.g., okay, you'd begin with, okay, some kind of predicate n, n, or some individual has some kind of property, if that's the case, we can derive that something has that property. We generalize over that instance. Here, we take a generalization, right, and derive an instance of it. Okay? You could say from general to specific, and then you could say um, specific to general, a little more general. Well, a little more general. Okay, or more generic or something. Um, the two other rules we're gonna look at are UG, universal generalization, and EI, you can guess what that is, existential instantiation. You may be able to guess the forms of these. Okay, I'm gonna to try to have room right here. Okay, so universal generalization, you'll begin this way, the same way you did it in EG, circle N, and then derive for all things, it has circle. For all X, X is circle. Now you can, you're gonna see right away that this is Problematic, so there's restrictions right here. I'm going to put an asterisk on this one. This one is not super easy to learn. EI um, goes like this you begin with an existential generalization. For some x, it has circle. And then we derive something more specific, general to to specific, here we go, specific to general, okay? So that's existential instantiation. These two, asterisks these, are a bit more difficult than these first two. So let's learn these two. That's the next step. That's weird, I put a double quote around rules Maybe I should have put it around new. I think that's what I meant. All right. In any case, let's learn universal instantiation. Okay. I'm going to begin with an example. Let's take the claim. 
all weasels are vicious. So we're going to begin with an English language statement. Okay. And I don't, I don't really believe this, but we'll just assume this is true. So from this claim here, all weasels are vicious, think about it. Doesn't it follow, therefore, that if, I don't know, let's take Joe. If Joe is a weasel, then Joe is vicious. Doesn't that intuitively follow? Isn't this little argument here valid? Okay. Let me symbolize this. Right? This premise and then this conclusion here. Okay. Remember how to symbolize an A statement? For all X. If it's a weasel, then it's vicious. All weasels are vicious. Let's talk about this thing a little bit. Um, this right here, let's just make this official. We didn't really do this last time. This right here is called a propositional function. It is a function, a statement that's with, that will be quantified over, that will be modified in a sense, will be spoken about, will be used, and in this case by this universal quantifier. Um, this definition of a propositional function right here is right comes from Bertrand Russell, if you care. Here, here we have a universal quantifier. So it's speaking about, it's quantifying over this propositional function. Okay? Um, this whole thing is called a universal quantification. A universal quantification. And really, any symbolization um, where this quantifier, where the universal quantifier ranges over the, the whole propositional function, it'll be called a universal quantification. Okay, so we've symbolized this first premise right there. Let's symbolize can call it this, the conclusion or what follows. If Joe is a weasel, W lowercase j, then V lowercase j. So this is a claim about an individual constant, um, right? An individual, we're referring to the individual by name, lower right, Joe, and we're referring to it by this lowercase letter here. This is a very, you could say, a very specific claim, a, a claim about an individual in the universe. We're talking about the whole universe right here. All weasels are vicious. We're making a claim about the universe. And here we make a claim about a specific individual in that universe. But if it's true that all weasels are vicious, then it follows that anything that is a weasel would also be vicious. Anything we can name. Joe, we could also infer uh, Lisa, right? WL arrow VL, me. If I'm a weasel, then I'm vicious. It follows. Now we're talking in this propositional function, it tells us we're really talking about, right, if we instantiate over this propositional function, we have to talk about only one instance. We can't do something like, oh, if Joe is a weasel, then I'm a weasel. 
that doesn't follow. That doesn't follow. Okay? For all x, x, if x is w, then x is y. We're not referring to any other variable here, right? I mean, if it was something like for all x and for all y, if um, x was w, then y was v, or something like that, then we could do something like this. But that's not what this claims. All right? This is only really talking about for any one single instance. Okay, so we're right there. This one doesn't, this one doesn't work right here. But there are no restrictions. There are no restrictions here. We can talk about any single individual. For that individual, if that individual is a weasel, then that individual is vicious. This is universal instantiation. Let me, let me write this down. From a universal quantification, okay, um, any instance of it may be derived. Any instance of. Okay, let's pause here for a second. Make sure you get this down. Let's put this little weasel argument in proof form. Line one. For all x, if x is w, then x is v. Line two, we can infer with our, we can call this, I guess, a premise here. We can infer now wj arrow vj. And what we'd write right here is this, line one. And which rule do we use? Our new rule, ui. That proof is done right there. Okay. Let's do another proof that uses ui. Check this one out. Okay. God created everything. Therefore, God created Texas. By the way, when I talk about individuals, they don't have to be animals or humans, that kind of thing. It could be a state, the, in, the individual Texas. Okay? God created everything, therefore God created Texas. Um, I'm not going to spend much time trying to figure out how to translate this. I'm going to, I'll just give you one way that works quite well to translate it. Premise one. Let's call the predicate. Um, let's call it C. What the predicate, let's call it, is created by God. For all things... Right? For, for any, anything, let's put it this way, right? For all x, x is created by God. So that's a way of symbolizing God created everything. It would be pretty odd to say something like, um, to refer to God in this case as an individual. Um, if it's something, then it was created by God. That doesn't work as well. Try that on your own. It won't work as well. Therefore, God created Texas. So let's call that a premise right here. For all x, cx. Texas was created by God, ct. One ui. Okay? Let's do another one that uses, that will now use some old rules. Okay, on the left hand side. I wrote down uh, the pattern of reasoning found in our new rule of inference, universal instantiation. Okay, let's do another argument. We start with the English language version of it because I want to get used to translating as well. Okay. Nothing logical frustrates me. 
This book frustrates me. So this book is illogical. Okay. All right, let's, let's symbolize this and then prove using our new rule plus old rules that the conclusion follows. Okay, this is a no statement, isn't it? An E statement. For all X, if it's logical, then it is not frustrate. Okay. Does not frustrate me, I should say. Okay. Uh, F stands for frustrates me. L stands for is logical. Those, those predicates. So that's a premise. Second premise is this. This book frustrates me. Um, F, and then let's say the book is individual. Let's call it uh, lowercase b. Okay? And the conclusion, what we want, that's a premise as well. What we want to derive, let's put that down here. This book is illogical. So not L lowercase b. Okay. Line three. Now you might be tempted to use, to see modus tollens right here, right? You can kind of see, oh, this, this could function as a negation of this, right? This could be the negation of the consequent, and then I can negate the antecedent, something like that. Um, but you actually cannot interface one and two right now. Right here, the only way to really use MT is if you have not FB. You don't have not FB, do you? You need to transform, you need to make, um, you need to transform this universal quantification into something you can use. Remember you have circle arrow square. For MT, you have circle arrow square, not square, therefore not circle. What's in square right here has got to be in what's in square right there. Right now we have, this will be functioning as, I guess you could say, as as square, something goes in for square right here, or not square, this needs to look like it. Okay, but that's not a problem, right? If it's the case that the universal claim, LX arrow not FX, then this would be true of any particular individual that you can pick. Now we're talking about this book, small b. So let's talk about b right here. Doesn't it follow from one? that if this book is logical, then this book does not frustrate me. That is line one UI. I'm gonna stop there for a second. Does that make sense? From one to three right here, we can drive three directly from one. This is a universal claim, this generalization, and we can drive any instance of it. There are no restrictions. Okay. Line four, now we see two and three can now interface. Now this doesn't look quite the same as propositional logic, correct? Because we're having these extra letters in here. In propositional logic, we had a single letter here, a single letter here, a single letter here, um, or this would have been represented by a single letter. Um, nevertheless, we still have the same function in here. We have circle, arrow, square, and we have this right here is equivalent to not square, isn't it? It's equivalent to that. I'm allowing you to skip the step of dn. Okay? So, what you can do here is derive from 1, 2, and 3 the negation of this circle here, the antecedent. Not LB. And you write right here 2, 3, MT. This is our first proof where we combine the old rules with the new rules, specifically just one new rule, UI. Okay, so far so good. Now let's learn EG, existential 
generalization. Okay. So let's take another English language argument. Oh, I forgot the L right there, English here. Let's go with this. Um, one, Joe is a vicious weasel. Okay, let's say that's true. Doesn't it follow, two, that something is a vicious weasel? Isn't that true? You go from a claim, a specific claim, so to speak, a particular claim here, in this case about Joe, you say, well, that's true. Can't you generalize and say, well, something is? Let's symbolize this, okay? Symbolize. One, let's see. Remember we learned how to do this? That vicious is a non-intersective, sorry, is an intersective adjective. So VJ and WJ. If that's true, doesn't it follow? Line one, well, let's call this EG, existential generalization, that something is both vicious and a weasel. So there we go. So, sort of a little argument, a little proof using EG. And let me write down the form here. As we saw before, if you have a claim about an individual, okay, we can derive a claim a more generalized claim, an existential claim here, okay? That something has that property, that predicate. So that would be the form of EG right there. Let's do a proof that uses both UI and our new rule EG. Okay, let's do this. In English, God created everything. So, God created something. Does that fall? All right. Premise one. We already learned how to do this. For all X, is created by God. I should write this here. C stands for he's created by God. Now you're saying you should have done that earlier. Okay. Yeah, but I guess it's not too late now. For all X, CX. All right. We can, we can say, tell the reader what we want to derive from this. God created something. Um... Something was created by God. Another way of saying it. So we're going to go from a, a universal quantification to an existential quantification. Okay. We want to derive an instance from this universal quantification. Does it matter what it is? Um, the other example we talked about when we talked about this book, Little B, we knew what we want to talk about. We want to talk about lowercase b, the book. Here, it doesn't really matter what we talk about. It could be any individual. What do you want to say? Um, I don't know. Um, let's see. Ooh, this square. Okay, let's call that little s. You could say, well, God created everything, therefore, God created this square. One UI. Okay. Three. Now, given that God created the square, the square was created by God, then something was created by God. Two E G. You like that?
Let's end this video with a longish proof from page 275 in your text. Okay. From chapter 17, section 2. There is an English, it begins with an English language version of the, the proof we're going to begin with, but I'm just going to give the symbolization. We're not going to spend time with the translation. Premise one, FD and BD. FD and BD. Call that premise, a premise here. Um, I don't, let's see, does the book, oh, the book D stands for a downed pilot. That's kind of depressing. So let's just do D is Diego. And Diego is this really cool photographer. Okay, um, line two. And this one goes, um, no E's are B's. Okay, for all X, if it's an E, then it's not B. That's a premise. Line three, it's another premise here. Um, if something is not E, then it is R. For all X, not EX, arrow RX. Okay, that's premise. Okay, and our target is something. Okay, or some R's are S. Something is both R and F. Okay, now you can see from this proof alone, get into this habit, what new rules you need to use. You're going to need to get rid of this universal quantifier so you can actually use this propositional function in a useful way. Um, you're going to need to use UI in this proof. You will also need to use EG because you need to tack on a universal, uh, sorry, an existential quantifier at some point. EG, namely the N, at least the N. Okay? So what we need to do is make premises two or three more manageable so they can interface with premise one. Now, since we're talking about Diego here, lowercase d, let's talk about Diego, right, in our derivations from lines two and three. So line four and line five. Let's use ui, two ui, to derive an instance of line two. That is, if Diego is e, then Diego is not B. And you can imagine what those stand for. It doesn't really matter, does it? Line five, if Diego is, is not E, then Diego, or small d, is R. So let's call that three UI. See how now lines, line one can now interface with these other two premises because we've transformed them using UI. Now remember our target here is some R's are S. Let's work backwards for a second. The second to last step, the penultimate step right here will be R. What do you think it's good? Well, it's gonna be about, B, about D. It'll be Diego is R and Diego is F. That will be the second to last step. Remember the back backwards technique? That's what we're shooting for, RD and FD. And look at, look at what we have, one, four, and five. Can we get RD and FD? It doesn't matter which order you get them in, okay? So let's see what we can do right here. Let's use simplification, right, and break apart line one. So six right here, we're gonna get FD, one simp. Line seven, BD, one simp. Now it might turn out that we don't need both six and seven. So, but right now I'm not really worried about that so much. 
we may use them, we're going to use at least one of them, so might as well bring them both down. No penalty um, if there's an extra line. Okay, now let's see what we can derive right here. Uh, RD and FD, okay. Oh wow, we already have FD right there, that's done. This one's already done. So really our target is RD, so that's good. We're done right there. To get RD, how do we do this? Well, hmm, lines four and seven, okay. With MT, you'll be able to drive not ED. And then not ED, you could drive RD. So it's doable. There's another way to do this too. And that is to use transposition on, looks like, line four, right, flip the order right here, and then take the negations of both, and then use HS, and then you should be able to get RD. Let's do that, that's a cool way. Line eight, let's use transposition on line four. You're gonna get BD, okay, arrow not ED, so that's for transposition. You notice the proofs in the book use transposition, at least in these couple chapters, use transpos transposition and HS quite often. Okay, BD arrow, not ED. Now look what you have. You have circle, arrow, square, and then square, arrow, triangle. Oh, on the list of old rules earlier, I forgot to put down HS. I knew I forgot something. Okay. So what we can derive right here, circle, arrow, triangle. BD, arrow, RD. And that was going to be 5 and 8. 5 and 8. HS. Now look at lines 7 and 9. We have modus ponens. Circle arrow square in this case. Circle so we can derive square which is RD. 7 and 9. Um, MP. Okay. We're almost finished. Line 11. Let's conjoin 6 and 10, RD and FD. So that's 6, 10, conj, conjunction. Line 12, well, if it's true that Diego is both R and F, then something is both R and F. 11 and, let's see, E, G, yeah. Does that make sense? What's with all the chainsaws and stuff outside? Do you hear that? Hopefully it's not interfering too much. Okay. There you go. That's a 12-step proof. Hopefully it's not too tricky. Definitely take this down, look it over carefully. It's using our, you know, our first two rules in predicate logic. Next video, we'll talk about the more difficult rules, uh, UG and EI. But hopefully you're good at this stage. All right, I'll see you next time.